Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this month's Friday NLA Breakfast Talk. My name is Benjamin O'Connor. I'm a director at New London Architecture, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, part of our latest research piece, Work London Office Revolution. For those of you less familiar with NLA, we are London's leading independent centre for the built environment. We bring together built environment professionals, politicians, and crucially, members of the public to learn about, debate, and ultimately have a voice on the future shape of London. Today's session focuses on the future of the workplace, looking at flexible ways of providing spaces that respond to employee demands, retrofitting existing buildings, and rethinking methods of construction that embrace the net zero agenda. This event is part of the NLA Work Programme. I'd like to thank our programme champions, City of London Corporation, EPR Architects, Landsec, and WRE. Uh, please I also remind the audience that there will be a chance to ask our speakers some questions at the end, and you can send those using the Zoom Q&A button, so please do post those throughout the presentations that we're going to have today. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our first speaker, and that is Sasha Lewin, who's CEO of WRE. Sasha, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Ben. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really excited to um, share some, some thoughts with you this morning, um, and I've been asked to present about one of our projects, um, the Arling and Hobbs building in Clapham Junction. Um, I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour through it, um, and then if there are any questions later, I'll be, of course, delighted to answer them. Um, okay, um, so Arding and Hobbs, um, it's a building by Clapham Junction Station directly opposite it, you see it here on the slide in red. Um, for those of you that don't know this part of the world, we're in Battersea in the Borough of Wandsworth, um, it's a really beautiful part of London, south of the river, wealthy commuter area, it's got a catchment of about 1.8 million people. Um, predominantly young people, um, about 50% um, of the population is aged between 25 and 44 years. Um, and it's an area that has lots of green um, spaces, um, Clapham Common, Wandsworth Common, um, North Court Road is um, just north or south, actually north on this picture, um, of the property, um, which is also known as Dappy Valley and offers high-end retail and leisure um, destination. Um, Clapham Junction itself is the busiest train station in Europe, believe it or not, um, by the amount of trains going through, with about 31 million passengers per year um, going through it. So in a, in a really interesting part of London. Um, the building has a long history. Um, it was built in 1884. Um, there's a postcard here in the middle and then sadly burned down in 1909, um, but quickly was rebuilt um, the following year. Um, and extended in the late 1920s um, when they added the Ardington Rooms, which um, became um, a beautiful dining room and venue where people got married. In the 60s, it was extended um, in a bomb-damaged um, site towards the back with a very cool modernist um, extension, which sadly does not exist anymore. Um, and then in the 70s, um, a canopy was added to the ground floor. Um, the building was listed in 2001, um, and 2005 saw Debenhams take over the premises. Debenhams, as we all know, went out of, um, well, went into administration and no longer exists. So we have the building predominantly back. Um, TK Maxx is also a tenant in this building and they remain in, in, in the building and trading out of it. Um, but over this sort of 100 year history, um, the building has become incredibly loved by the population. When we were at the local um, population, when we did our planning application, we had a thousand responses on it. It's more than Battersea Power Station had with people sharing uh, personal stories from my parents got married in this building through I bought my first dishwasher in this building. Um, and there is, um, it's not just about bringing life back into the building, but it's also about making sure that this building survives as this iconic um, centerpiece of Clapham Junction um, into the next generation. So how can we do that and how we're planning to do that? Um, I just wanted, before I go back into the building, touch on a couple 
um, of themes that we think are happening in, in London at the moment. Um, and one is the concept that, that we call decentralization or the move away from, from clustering. Um, and here really is a trend that we've seen at WRE is that historically, um, until quite recently, uh, occupiers from certain industries tended to cluster very closely into the same areas. I mean, we've got the city, which obviously has the finance world with even a subsection for insurance. Um, we've got the West End, which used to host exclusively media companies and law firms, you know, clustered around Midtown. Um, and all of this is changing today. The occupiers are much more footloose. They're going everywhere. Um, we, and we're seeing this in areas like, like King's Cross, which by now has become its own cluster. But when it started, it was definitely off pitch um, and um, you know, sticking closer to Clapham Junction, Battersea, of course, Apple um, moving down to Battersea Power Station. Um, and there are lots of reasons for this, which I won't dwell on. Um, but what has become clear is that where what occupiers look for first and foremost um, are, are really two things. It's not anymore where are my peers based, but it is how good is the communication, the transportation network that to get people to come to my building, my staff, my colleagues, and and my customers, visitors, um, and of course how good is the building. Um, That's the second question, um, is that today it's about better buildings. It's about um, not anymore the question, how many people can I squeeze onto a small floor plate um, and what does it cost me? Um, the questions being asked um, to us by occupiers are predominantly the questions up here on the screen. Um, is how do we create good environment for our staff? How is well being taken care of? Um, what does the building offer um, the, our people, um, our staff? Um, does it meet the culture of our company um, with regards to sustainability um, and well-being? Um, and I think all modern office developers today are looking at those questions first and foremost. So when we looked at Arding and Hobbs, that is what we also looked at. So architecturally first, what are the key interventions? It's a historic building, it's a listed building. So of course, with any historic building, um, you want to try and, um, and restore it to its sort of future glory, but also upgrade it to perform in line with expectations of today. Um, and the key things that we were doing is we were remove, we're planning to remove the canopy which was added in the 70s, you saw it in that short historic run through. Um, that's partly because the canopy, um, by removing it, we increased the height, we allow people to, or the, the, the way the building's perceived. Um, we don't increase the height of the building, but you can enjoy the building when you stand on the pavement and look up. At the moment, you kind of squashed underneath it and it wasn't part of the original um, work, but we are also, um, centering the building back onto the ground. It seems to be quite cut off. We're adding a rooftop extension um, to the building. Um, and we are um, creating a large roofed garden um, that I'll talk you through um, in a second as well. There's the rooftop extension. Um, this was done for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the, the, I'll be disingenuous if I didn't say that it, it gave us um, an additional value driver, but it also felt that the buildings could, could do with a crown. Um, and um, by removing a lot of the, the sort of plant work that was up there, bringing that to the back of the building, we, we liberated this roof and could actually use it for much more exciting use than storage and um, old plant work. Um, here you also see the facade works um, and creating a much more beautiful facade than currently this chopped up um, facade that we've got. Um, on the roof extension, um, we're using natural materials um, as much as we can. Um, and we are creating over 8,000 square feet of roof garden. 
um, which is along um, the side of the building, allowing um, people to really go up and mingle there. And for us, this roof garden is a central sort of feature of what Harding and Hobbs in the future is going to be about. We don't didn't want this to be just a big decked area with greenery on it, um, but we wanted it to be a really engaging place that has different parts to it. Um, there are areas where you can go and hide, like in here or back there, um, and get some quiet space away from it all. This part will have um, a screen um, and you can turn it into an open air cinema. You can have presentations up there. Um, this is a games area that is a flexible area um, for shuffleboard for we, we're not quite sure yet what 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 will go on there. Um, and then there's sort of covered areas here for meetings. Um, and of course, we've got this incredible cupola um, that in itself is over a thousand square feet of space um, that will be used to activate that space and work as a cafe, um, but also can be rented as meeting rooms um, or for dining experiences um, by the people of the building. Um, here is a slightly different view of it, um, of how it will look. Um, within the rooftop extension, oops, I went too quick on that, but doesn't matter, um, the use will be, will be office use, but everybody can access the roof um, that works in the building or uses the building um, in any shape. It's not um, exclusive for the tenant on the top floor. On the ground floor, we um, are leaving um, a flexible retail and um, leisure use the same with the basement and the first floor um, has the optionality to move between office and um, retail leisure uses as well. We are creating a large new office reception. And I think one of the sort of really fun features that we've got in this building is um, the vertical transportation is going to be through an escalator system. Um, we initially had the plan to remove the escalators which are in there as a department store and replace them with lifts as would be conventional to do in an office building. Um, but we actually analyzed the escalators and thought this is a really fun way to get people up and down the building. It's an engaging way. You see your colleagues going through the building. It's, it's quite efficient in terms of the amount of people that, that can pass through it. Um, and it plays into the whole well-being part of sort of encouraging you to also walk. I appreciate you can stand on an escalator, but, um, but lots of people sort of tend to move through the escalator system as well. Um, and we are looking to create a, a very carefully blended mix of retail and leisure um, that will support the building um, and the local area and bring the feeling of North Court Road, which is lots of smaller retailers, um, more local um, retailers into the building to have a, um, a really good curated mix here um, that makes it fun um, to engage with that building on, on the ground floor. Um, here is the reception sort of study. I have to say, I believe, I believe everybody can download this and please do so if you want to after the presentation, but these are not yet finalized um, pictures. So these are just ideas. So it may look quite different in the end, but to give you a bit of a feeling of the way that we expect the, the building to, to come back to life. Um, so in the reception, we've got a lot of space. Um, it's a very generous reception. Um, restoring the historic um, uh, building frame and then working with um, drapery, um, which was a big part of um, the original Debenhams um, and, and colors. Sorry to interrupt, Sasha. We'll just need to speed up a little bit if you can. Thank you. I can speed up very quickly. Um, so I'll just flick through these pictures because really it's just pretty pictures. Um, here you see the escalator core um, and the way the offices can, can look with creating um, light through the central um, core with the escalators by putting a big screw light through. And then we can celebrate some of the really exciting old features that are in this building. Um, 
Amenities, I don't think I need to dwell on. We all know that amenities are key. We're trying to bring in some very generous ones into the basement. Um, and then, of course, the curated uh, sort of mix of uses with gyms, um, food, um, uh, restaurant, and some exciting others. Um, sustainability, um, again, maybe not the most exciting slide here with these charts, but um, we can meet very high sustainability targets in this building. Uh, it is a, 100 years old and listed, so there's a little bit of um, challenges here, but we're, we're pushing that as far as possible. Um, and we are bringing it back to be a fun building that um, you can do all these things here listed on the slide. Um, so hopefully that gave you a bit of a whistle stop idea. Sorry if I ran over. Um, and uh, thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Sasha. Sorry for giving you a little nudge there. Uh, if you did join uh, while Sasha was speaking or giving his presentation, please do remember you can ask questions throughout for Sasha or any of our speakers using the Zoom Q&A button, and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, our next speaker is Oliver Booth, who's partner at GNT, and he'll be presenting their Mass Timber Office Forum. Oliver. Thanks, ben. Thanks Ben. Thanks, and good morning to everyone. Thank you to the NLA for for inviting me to this. Thank you to Peter and, and the team. Um, and just quickly, I'll just say, Sasha, I've been going to that Arlington Hobbs since I was a very little boy, and it's great to see it restored back to its, uh, its former glory. So um, I look forward to seeing that. Um, so basically, I just want to talk you a bit through uh, the GNT Mass Timber Forum, which we ran uh, through the pandemic. Um, my name is Oliver Booth. I'm a partner at GNT in the Quantity Surveying Division. Um, but in the last 10 years, I've found myself specialising more in mass timber, and by that I mean cross-laminated timber, laminated veneer lumber, glue lambs, um, and, and the like, and, and modern methods uh, of which you know, mass timber finds its, itself into. So basically, um, in January 2019, um, I was doing the rounds, going around seeing various developers just talking about developments in mass timber and what's happening. Um, and it was actually a meeting with Land Securities, with Neil Reed and uh, Colin Kennedy, uh, and they said, wouldn't it be a great idea to do a, a forum where we can get everyone together? So rather than seeing people individually, we all discuss the themes, the issues and, uh, and, and pull together a series in a forum. So we thought that's a great idea, but obviously we thought we'd hold it in person back in January 2019. Uh, and we'd all sit around the board table and we invited um, about 50 to uh, developers from various different developers across the country uh, that we've worked with for many, many years. Um, then the pandemic hit. Um, and so the opportunity was to, to turn that into a webinar, uh, which actually turned out to be the best thing because it meant that we could have a lot more people attend, we could record it, disseminate the information, and it's all about the information share, um, and, and, then, and then actually send it out everywhere. So it wasn't just for the developers, although initially it was just for, for them initially to do that in the first place. So in terms of the presentation today, I just want to take you through a bit about the forum, um, what the different webinars are. This is all downloadable, by the way, off the website, and there's a white paper as well if you're interested. Um, the kind of key findings, um, like the NLA, we, we use the function to try and get some feedback in terms of data and whatnot. Um, I'll talk about what's come up, what's happened since, the updates and the outcomes, um, which have been really positive. Um, and we're not going to just leave it there, we will take it further. Uh, and then next steps and a conclusion. So the first thing we did uh, was just try and map out you know, how many people are involved in, in the industry. Um, and it was actually staggering uh, to realize how many stakeholders are involved, uh, how many key decision makers. Uh, and what was very, very clear is it, it isn't always joined up. Um, and the first session, probably the one that was the, the, got the best feedback was the one with the insurers. So we spoke to, you know, well-known uh, brokers, uh, including uh, Gallagher's, Lockton, Marsh, and we had AXA, Zurich and Aviva on there. Um, and this is one of the things at the moment that we're trying to unpick um, and, and help as best as possible. It seems that we can get there often on the construction insurance, but it's that post occupancy insurance and the way the data that the insurance industry have um, in terms of you know, estimated maximum losses at the end. Um, so that was a really fascinating session. That's certainly worth watching that. And it's been fascinating since because uh, a number of developers, 50 plus developers, are so desperate to do some kind of mass timber buildings to contribute to getting to net carbon zero, because that is what this is all about. This is about, you know, carbon is killing the planet. We need to therefore reduce carbon and look at all different ways that we're producing carbon. Um, and, and timber contributes to that reduction, um, not only in its kind of low embodied carbon, but also in its sequestered carbon, the fact that it locks up and takes out the atmosphere, that, that, that carbon sink, if you like. So 
Um, you know, that, that, that was a, a big thing for, for everybody. And they want to do it so much that they're actually having discussions about pooling together and creating a captive alliance, uh, which will actually look at self-insuring their own buildings. So the idea of developers doing this and going into the insurance world uh, shows, I think, how, how serious they are about doing this. But also we, we looked at, you know, all the other people involved, you know, funders, uh, and it seems to be, from what I understand, a lot more funding uh, coming forward for green buildings and timber just slips into that, that category. Developers, all of the consultant team, um, you know, subcontractors and bringing them on board and, and getting their advice from the earlier stages is, is, is really important. The builders themselves, the main contractors, they have been learning as well and they continue to learn and share information. The manufacturers, and these are huge businesses, uh, predominantly based out in, in, in Austria and Germany. Um, the forestry, my understanding is that forestry has actually increased in the last 10 years by 10%. So in, this, isn't a, this isn't a rainforest situation where we're actually decimating uh, trees, you know, we're replanting trees. It's all part of that circular economy. It's not that linear economy and what it's about, you know, everything um, but joining up. Um, the regulators and leg legislators, and that was, was an interesting uh, take on things. Uh, testing, uh, fire testing, water ingress, um, you know, embodied carbon studies. You know, is this, you know, truly as sustainable as we believe it to be? The agents that actually market these buildings uh, and public perception and so on. So we basically pulled together nine sessions. Uh, insurance, uh, which I talked about, fire, we've got some of the leading engineers, the London Fire Brigade listened in and gave us feedback, and it was really welcome, you know, how positive they were about it. They just want to understand what the strategy is, you know, post the you know, awful situation that happened several years ago, they just want to make sure that workmanship is, is as good as it, it can be, that the fire strategy is well thought out and considered, um, and, you know, they're not precluding uh, any material particularly. Um, the sustainability session was was obviously one that was was the most popular. Um, as I said, timber is 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 low carbon in its embodied carbon in its sequestered carbon. Um, you know, we, we are material agnostic, and you know, concrete and steel always have a place. Um, in fact, you know, concrete is probably one of the most popular materials on the planet. My understanding is a resource after water. It's the most popular uh, resource on the planet in terms of of, of what we use. Um, I read the other day that 35% of life cycle carbon produced in the building happens during the, the construction phase. So, you know, and, and you know, concretely, look at the stats of concrete, um, it, it is quite staggering. You know, 80% um, of global emissions uh, come from cement, uh, only 2.5% is from aviation flu, so uh, fuel. So we are, what we're talking about here is that, you know, concrete uh, does have its, uh, you know, its problems in terms of uh, carbon, and we're trying to fix the planet here. You know, this is a serious this is a climate situation, but it doesn't mean that we should stop using concrete. It just means that we should use it when it's best used. And I think probably the overwhelming message of the whole forum was it's not necessarily about purest timber. It's about hybrid construction. It's about using materials where they're best, best used. You know, if we can try and reuse buildings as much as possible, um, you know, and that lends itself to lightweight construction timber, then that's definitely the way forward. Um, and, you know, if often sometimes we just can't reuse that building. So unfortunately, we have to demolish it. And I think we just have to be realistic about that. But certainly reuse of the building is, is important. We've seen a lot more things coming in as well um, in terms of uh, be, making buildings for the future more flexible and timber lends itself to that. Um, making sure that it's demountable. Again, all part of that circular economy piece. So there's lots of things that we're finding coming in there. Uh, we, we, we also talked about best practice. Uh, we, we've got the con contractors on board to talk to us about that, um, you know, procurement, uh, cost, uh, capacity supply chain, we went right down the other end just to hear what their thoughts were, structuring the acoustics, leasing and sales from the agents, and they were really, really positive about it. Uh, and then we finished with, with architecture. So you know, in terms of the, the key findings uh, that came out um, from, from, from the, uh, the, the webinars, if you like, sustainability and well-being was overwhelming, you know, and, and there was this whole theme as well in terms of well-being, it's about the biophilia, it's about wanting to get in touch with the environment and people do seem to like to be in timber buildings. Uh, it does seem to, you know, improve their well-being uh, and it's becoming more and more popular and more prevalent. Um, collaboration expertise, you know, all of us working together, sharing our information uh, so that, you know, we, we basically all learn from each other and, and, and we'll make, you know, it, it a lot easier to, to adopt it. Um, improvements in regulation standards and testing and also environmental assessment methods you know the likes of Briam and well perhaps they could factor in you know extra points for for adopting timber because we know it's sustainable we've seen France is mandating it in public buildings you know globally Australia Canada America um, New Zealand um, you know all these countries are adopting it the UK does seem to be a little bit behind it seems to be a bit more risk averse 
Um, and perhaps there's things that we could look in there and government incentive, perhaps through taxation and things like that could actually help us adopt it more. And then this, this theme of don't just force timber onto a project. It doesn't have to be all timber, it just perhaps be part of timber. So we, you know, we did also lots of polls uh, to get feedback. And as you can see here, you know, we said to the developers, what's the main driver behind you doing it? Surprise, surprise, sustainability, reducing carbon, health and well-being, you know, that trumped cost and program. That's not to say if it doesn't cost, you know, a significant amount, they won't do it. But as Bill Gates said, we have to take a different view uh, in terms of, you know, reducing carbon and improving the planet. And often that might cost more, but it's as, as Mark Carney said, there's value in values. And I think people are taking a different view on, on, on their projects as a result. You know, another poll, do you believe the sustainability of mass timber benefits outweigh the challenges faced with viability and cost? An overwhelming 77% of the audience said yes. And these, you know, these are leading blue chip developers from around the country. Uh, how urgently do you believe investment is needed to create dedicated standards to enable mass timber construction to be adopted? Again, you know, if people aren't sitting on the fence here. We know we need to legislate for it. We need to help. Uh, we need to do more testing. We need to understand it as best as possible so that you know, we can adopt more timber buildings. And, and we are seeing more and more Google Office uh, up at King's Cross. Um, the black and white building in Shoreditch, if, if, if anybody should definitely go and see that, we've just topped out the frame on that. Um, there are some excellent examples of buildings that have been retrofitted and refurbished. Um, the Republic building over in Docklands, uh, old gramophone works as well, and, and, and several others, you know, it, it going extending up, extending out, actually in the case of a public building, actually extending into the atria, which was oversized originally, creating the area and creating different spaces. Um, you know, another, another poll, off-site off -site testing can be expensive. Would you consider collaborating as developers? I mean, this kind of thing is unheard of. And yet, you know, they've all got together off the back of the forum uh, and they're actually working together and say, can we share testing information? Can we share testing data? So I'm coming to the end now. I just want to figure on some of the things that have come out of it. So, um, you know, the insurance industry has got together, realises there is a huge market here. It's something they need to be involved with. And they, they you know, they're looking to do guidance documents, share data, share information. And as I said, this captive alliance conversation is happening amongst the developers about the idea of them actually potentially self-insuring themselves to unlock this. Uh, testing, fire testing is happening, you know, all over at the moment. The Structural Timber Association, one of the major uh, governing bodies, is, is, is just about to conclude a load of fire testing, which will help prove to the people that are important that, that it, it is safe. It is safe in a fire situation. The BCO has taken it on board. They understand that timber offices is now a big thing, whether it's combining it with other materials or purist timber offices. And they're, they're reviewing their own stuff internally to see how that they can write um, standards for that. Um, and, and other groups have come out a bit of lots of people getting together to try and unlock the project. The problem, all those stakeholders coming together to try uh, and, 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 and make this uh, happen easier and, and, and break down the barriers. Um, funding has come from the Loudest Foundation with the Tam Timber Accelerator Hub, doing lots of PR, but also you know, basically getting information out there to people to help. Um, we've talked about the developer uh, collaboration and the testing research and knowledge. And this is my last slide, really, but one of our panellists from, from then Lease, Kevin Chapman, um, who was involved in the, the, the buildings over in Australia for Lend Lease, um, the, the International House, uh, Duramaru, um, Kingdom Street, you know, iconic buildings, um, which I, you know, if you haven't seen, I urge you to have a look at in, in Australia, in, in Sydney and Brisbane. He said there is a bigger story to tell around the purpose, neighbourhood and ethics. Timber is just the first chapter. So, again, you know, we're not saying that timber is... The, the silver bullet, the panacea, if you like. But what we are saying is definitely has a place. We know that it contributes to reducing carbon. Um, and I think in this post-pandemic office world, uh, we need to you know, look to use materials, natural materials, to help contribute. Um, and, and timber is definitely one of those. Great, thank you very much, Oliver. Our next speaker is Sho Ito, Associate Director at Army Fender Katsalidis, who will tell us more about the future of flexible workspaces. Sho, over to you. Thank you, Ben. And as you've eloquently introduced, my name is Sho. Uh, I'm an associate director at AFK Studios and we're a design practice uh, based in London. And much like many others on this forum have been heavily engaged in recent times around the discussion around what the future of the workplace will be. And it's clear to us that flexibility will be a massive uh, element of the key to success in this sector. But flexibility is such a a broad term, it covers such a large topic. So with the, the, the short time that we have today, I'd really like to talk about a particular sub sector of the workplace environment, which is that of the flex office. 
and more specifically, and more specifically, we've um, been lucky to collaborate in partnership with uh, the WorkTech Academy in producing uh, a report that was recently published called The Future of Flex, which uh, really represents an ongoing uh, effort to speak with various members of the of the industry and in understanding what the uh, future of the Flex office will have in in the in the marketplace moving forward as we consider where we lie in in, in the post pandemic environment. And so I'm privileged to be able to give a really brief snapshot summary of uh, what this report entails. And perhaps it's important to, to really say, well, what is a flex office? If we think about the traditional landlord uh, tenancy agreement, uh, the arrangement that is uh, the, probably the most common model that we speak of when we talk about the office on one end, and then we've got the the co-working uh, agile hot desking environment on the other. In between, we have this the flex office model, which is really allows occupiers to have a dedicated working environment that fosters their uh, corporate profile and allows uh, community to, to flourish. But with the added benefits of having more of the flexible short-term uh, lease agreements that give that flexibility, it's ready, it's plug and play, they can move in, don't have the, the, the costs of the fit out and the lead times associated with it. And they're often managed by uh, separate operators. And we believe that this particular sector, the flex office will be a growing market sector in the years to come. And, and to substantiate that, perhaps if we just take a step back and look at the bigger picture, uh, the, a few years ago, this, this, this sector would have been dominated heavily by the freelance and startup occupiers, which with the, the government mandated lockdown, we saw a mass exodus of, of all these occupiers uh, across the, the flex office sector. Uh, and, and as they became accustomed to working from home and with the uh, incentives of reducing overheads, uh, the, there's been a, a significant decrease of that particular demographic taking up the, the flex office, but, but more surprisingly, a, a, a significant increase in the corporate occupiers. And when we sort of look at that with the return to the office uh, and some of the things that Sasha talked about as well in terms of the decentralization, large corporations uh, have an incentive to start bringing people back into the office place, but finding that right balance between uh, having somewhere central that everyone can gather and foster that community, but also managing an access to a more regional hub to minimize commute times. And so that hub and spoke model that we speak about uh, has, has seen a, a big attraction towards the larger corporate occupiers. But also in some of the conversation that both Sasha and Oliver have talked about, there's a real desire for landlords to uh, reevaluate some of the assets uh, that are currently existing, both from a sustainability agenda, but also making sure that they maintain a relevance in the marketplace and hybrid offices where there is an injection of this flex office component allows a more dynamic uh, asset to be offered into the marketplace. So when we're seeing an increase in both supply and demand added with the, the, the benefits of uh, a reduced financial risk through short-term commitments and the added flexibility of, of an agile working environment, uh, we can see why it's starting to become a much more attractive uh, sector in, in the workplace environment. And just to add some, some figures to this, some, some recent reports that, uh, that have uncovered through uh, uh, experts in the commercial real estate uh, industry have, have indicated that as it, as it stands today, 5% uh, is what is represented by the uh, flex office sector in the, in the UK at the moment. But if things continue on the current trajectory, uh, we could see this increase by up to 12.5% up to by the end of 2023. Uh, the reports have indicated that large industries such as professional services and the finance and tech sector, the surveys have indicated that up to 30% of these occupiers uh, or 32% of these occupiers feel that a fifth of their portfolio of, what, of the space that they occupy will actually be taken up by flex office uh, in the years to come. And if the conditions continue to be more favorable, some estimates have indicated that it might increase by up to 20%. So it's clear to us that the flex office and the demand for it is, is increasing. And 
some of the influences that might help drive this even further when we think about density and utilization, such a key component of how occupiers might assess what their future office needs might be. What we know is that in the last year or two, that's definitely uh, hybrid working where we're working a combination of both going into the office and working from home. That, it's, I could say with a degree of confidence that that's here to stay. But at what capacity, I guess, is, is the question. A year ago, perhaps when social distancing was at its peak, there was uh, speculation or a discussion around coming in in a more shift uh, arrangement where people will come in at different times of the office. And so the densities will be a bit more consistent to allow less occupation. But as we start to ease and things start to relax a bit more, we're starting to see the conversation of that changing where uh, companies are starting to assess the culture and looking at ways in which we can get everybody into the office on particular days, whether it's a Monday or a Friday, where they become the, the community or, or, or culture days. And so what that's indicating is that the density and utilization rates are constantly fluctuating and it's, 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 it's difficult to continuously assess that. And so the flex office allows a degree of experimentation where for a two to three year lease term, uh, they can assess where the patterns of people coming into the office will lie and make a longer term commitment uh, thereafter. But just to also touch on another influencing factor, the impact of obsolescence. And, and again, Sasha and Oliver spoke about this through their presentation just a moment ago, the importance of repurposing vacant assets. So the retail sector is another big one that's relevant post pandemic with the increase of online shopping. Naturally then the, 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 the brick and mortar buildings are seeing a, a, a great deal of vacancy, uh, Debenhams as an example there. And so there's a, a, an interest from landlords to find more dynamic and interesting ways to repurpose these assets. And grade A buildings we know are, 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 are becoming a, a hot bit of, bit of property, but it's allowing or it's rather it's it's creating a lag then in the grade B and C type buildings. So they need to then elevate their asset offering into the marketplace. And a flex office is, is another example of that, of how that can provide more diversity into the, the mixed use. And this is often being supported as well by the local authorities, which are encouraging more mixed use developments, which is extremely helpful. And I suppose perhaps more most importantly to all of us, there's a, a, a definite change in occupied demands. Uh, we all know that the diversity of amenities uh, is going to be key, ensuring that the uh, coming into the office provides a destination and a purpose rather than just coming into the office because uh, we, we have to or, or, or there's a, a purposeless hybrid working environment. There needs to be a reason why people come in. And it's important that uh, the work settings to which people are going into offer a diversity of both focus and collaboration, uh, a varied mix of how you can actually work most effectively. But on the other end of the spectrum as well, culture and community is really key as well. And so providing an office space through a flex office allows all of these things to take place. And so I suppose in, in summary, I have kept this quite short. If, if you look out to the, to the future, um, what does that look like? With the combination of opportunities for, for, for landlords to provide a more adaptive mixed use through uh, perhaps more older building stock that can provide a degree of authenticity as well through uh, some of the characteristics that they embody. The attraction of choice and diversity that occupiers can get through the destination of a flex office. The, the benefits as well of the reduced risk, you know, if, if you think about a traditional lease term of, of perhaps 10 to 15 years or thereafter, thereafter uh, compared to a, a shorter term two year lease, uh, typically through, uh, through the flex office, it allows occupiers to experiment and continually adapt to the ever changing uh, environment that we're all facing. And again, the expansion of where the workforce is being based, you know, we all want to reduce our commute times and we're seeing people move out into the more, uh, the wider, the commuter belts and, and the regional areas and flex offices also provide a great way to provide a satellite office to continue a sense of, of, of community and a hub for, for occupiers. So all of these things are very attractive and all lead towards substantiating that the future of work will be all about flexibility 
and that we believe the flex offices will be a big part of that story. So hopefully that gave a very brief overview of what uh, some of the findings of that report entails. Great, thank you very much, Sho. Uh, we're now going to bring all our speakers together for a panel discussion. And just to remind you that you can ask questions to any of our panelists uh, using the Zoom Q&A button. But firstly, I'd like to welcome our panelists, Ziona Strelitz, Director of ZZA Responsive User Environments, and Alison Darville, who's an Associate Director at Bennett's. Uh, Ziona, what are you hearing from users in terms of demands? And what do architects, planners, and developers need to do now in order to track people back into the office? Well, hi everybody. Thanks, Ben, and thanks all the panelists for a really interesting swathe of um, of content uh, to put into our conversation. I'd really like to take a moment to step back and to say that we're treating COVID as though it is a revolutionary moment. But when I look back to contextualize in the two decades that preceded COVID, I didn't work with a client that didn't practice hybrid working to an extent. I think it's really important to see that what COVID has done is to accentuate and make explicit trends that were already in practice. So yes, when I worked with clients who were early adopters like BT, like Cisco, like PwC, they made agile working very upfront because they either sold the technology that enabled it or because 40% of their workforce were doing audits on client sites and so it was a no brainer to save the space. But we as an industry went out wholesale and sold agility. We sold the mantra, work is what you do, it's not where you are. And, um, it's a surprise in a way that we're now looking at hybridity as if it's a kind of new kid on the block. It's been with us for at least two decades to the extent that if I would visit, um, you know, on a research capacity or consulting capacity or to judge awards, if I would visit any building on a Monday or Friday, the host, whether it was in public administration or finance, would apologize that there were so few people there. So um, uh, we've been on this track. And the other point that I want to make is that the kinds of themes that colleagues on this um, session today have talked about, the kinds of user aspirations for well being, for external space, for more local space, they have been with us. Uh, on an incremental pathway for, for years. And in very recent studies that we've done um, in student environments, they have been growing incrementally, I would say over, in a trackable way over about 10 years. So none of this is new. I think COVID's been an accentuator and what it's doing is flushing out some redundancy. So um, where does this bring us in terms of uh, where are we going and the future of the office? And I take my soundings not from current CEOs who are people who know how to do their job, who in the, uh, uh, in the main have very comfortable living accommodation, but I'm taking my soundings for the future of work from the higher education sector, because those are the people who are going to be the workplace of the future. And what people who are young recruits and people who are entering the workforce want is uh, a social context to work in. They want mentorship, they want coaching, they want to absorb culture. And actually what everyone, including my current cohort want is to work somewhere that in fact isn't home. I think we are all absolutely sick and tired of having uh, a home environment. And so the last thing that we're wanting is a workplace that replicates our kitchen. You know, that theme that you should feel cozy and at home and relaxed and it should feel like, you know, you could put your introducing the kitchen table into the workplace, I think is in fact, the opposite of what people are looking to when they go to a place of work that's a contrast. So 
I'm going to take a cue on this from James Timpson. And if I look down to read, I'm going to quote. He says, it's time we saw sense and stopped talking ourselves into creating a phantom workforce. We need to get people back into the office to achieve the advantages of being together in a work community, helping each other out, talking through problems, fueling pace, ideas, performance, mutual bonds, and resilience. Well, I kind of really am with that. But on the other hand, an international report, which uh, I wrote a decade ago called Why Place Still Matters in the Digital Age, did a, a wealth of interviews with individuals working in third places, outside city centers and at central hubs. And of course, its relevance is absolutely still on the button because it advocates the kinds of uh, decentralized, locally accessible, professional environments that have been talked about today. And yes, commuting is a drain. We can, most people can use the time better, whether it's to relax, go to the gym, sleep longer, work more, most people can use the time better. At the same time, as I've said, people want a break from home. So what can we as an industry do about it? I think there's loads of opportunities. There are loads of opportunities for professional work environments in radial towns and suburbs. There are lots of opportunities for smaller scale settings because a lot of my research shows that the big, big building, the consolidated proposition that our industry spent two decades selling to a large, to, you know, big organizations. Um, and I've been part of it, you know, many of us have been part of saying you can have a much more efficient operation if you get rid of your, you know, 52 regional offices and local offices and you have one big bang. That is really counter trend now. So we can help people to create more intimate environments, even within large buildings. And finally, you know, we can't be sure that this pandemic's over or that this is the last of the pandemics. So I have been helping people over the last 18 months to create quality central office environments. You know, the, those are still in demand. And the sorts of characteristics that we have to think about are not only the look and feel, but the things that really assure safety and well-being, ventilation, circulation, easy access to outdoor space, touch-free controls, all of these things. There's loads of work to do, but I don't think it's a new tomorrow. I just think it is a accentuation of where we've been coming from. Thank you very much, Siona. Uh, Alison, uh, from your experience, how are architects rising to the challenge of building well-detailed offices that are flexible and future-proof? Um, well, I think that the challenge is actually more about how we can adapt our existing building stock to make good, uh, unique, characterful office. Um, I mean, I think the other um, panelists of uh, the other speakers have already talked about how we need to address climate change and the net zero carbon agenda. So the project where I'm working on for Landsec uh, at Timber Square, we're um, extending and refurbishing 80%, keeping 80% of the existing structure of a 1950s print works. Um, and part of the, um, the characterful space that we're going to create is because of the, the challenges and the idiosyncrasies of that existing building. And that will make good workspace that people want to come to. It's not like your kitchen table. It, it's going to have a character. It's, it's going to make a place that people want to come to work. Um, and where we are extending, where, we've, where we are building new, um, as Oliver's already mentioned, uh, we're looking at low carbon technology. So we're uh, using CLT, a hybrid CLT and steel frame. Um, and that's inherently very flexible. Um, you can, the advantages you've got with CLT is you can, um, you can create holes, you can move the structure around a lot more flexibly than you could with a concrete structure. So for example, if you, a tenant comes in and they want to have um, a linking stair between two floors, you can just lift a bit of CLT out. So it's much more flexible than um, a concrete frame would be. 
Um, I think the other things that we're looking at, um, more outside space, terraces, uh, much more um, exposure to fresh air, ventilation. So um, even if the position of the building might not be suitable for uh, natural ventilation at day one, we need to be looking into the future that when air quality in London gets better with more electric cars, we can look at mixed mode and natural ventilation and putting in opening windows from day one. Great, thank you very much, uh, Alison. Please do ask any questions you have. We've got about 10 minutes for a discussion now. Um, there's one uh, quite quick one, hopefully, that Sasha, that you could uh, respond to, which is just on the energy efficiency of escalators versus lifts considered. Was that considered in the, in the project and what was the outcome? Um, it was considered. Um, I think not just the energy efficiency, the, the overall efficiency. I have to admit, I, I don't have the data to hand. Um, I think, um, uh, it depends on the amount of users. Um, there comes a point when it tips over. Um, I'm not quite sure that um, in the office building, we've got about a thousand people probably using that building. Um, and depending on the way it's being used, it'll depend how much they'll go up and down it. Um, but um, there wasn't a huge amount of difference in it, or at least not when we analyzed it to the point where we said, oh, wow, this is, this is a problem for us. So um, we did look at it. Great, thanks, Sasha. Uh, Oliver, you got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I just want to um, respond to Patrick Devlin, who, who just uh, emailed the group. Because, uh, if I did say 80%, it's, a, it's definitely, it's 100%, 8%. That must have been a slip of the tongue. 8% of global emissions from cement. If it was 80%, then we've got a very, very big problem. Um, but, can I just say as well on that, though, that, you know, that there are alternatives in GGBS. And look, no one's saying get rid of concrete. There's a time and a place for concrete. There's some things you can only build it out of concrete. So I, I think it's really important that we stay material agnostic. Um, this is really just about, you know, discussing about using other materials and mixing them together. So, so thanks, Patrick, for picking it up. I just wanted to clear that. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Oliver. I, I think there was a question here about Timber, but I think you actually answered that in your presentation. So I'll, I'll skip that one. But we've got a very good question here, which I'm going to come to show to first. Just uh, commercial landlords and developers seem to understand well the flex office trend, but thousands of square foot of office space are being delivered in ground floor of mixed use schemes led by residential developers. How do you make the flex office work when there is perhaps less expertise about the operations and business models of the flex office? Um, if I come to show first, and then uh, if anyone else would like to respond, pop your hand up. Thanks, Ben, and thanks for the question, Celine. Uh, it's it's really great to see residential developers uh, encouraging uh, the injection of, of um, area dedicated to flex office. I think really much like any other project that has uh, a third party coming in, whether it's the FMB industry or, or, or the like, the early engagement with with the uh, operator, which will still be present in, in a lot of these models, uh, is is going to be key. Understanding their needs and requirements, but if but short of that, prior to it, I, I think there's an onus on designers and working with the design team to ensure that flexibility is maintained in 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 the actual footprint of where that space is is located, whether it's ensuring subdivisibility or having the right MEP requirements to to accommodate for a, a greater degree of density. But ultimately, at the, at the end of the day, a lot of it's going to be fit out based and operational. So that, that comes down to the operator themselves. Uh, so it's continuous engagement, I suppose, would be the best way to ensure that that many, uh, has the greatest level of success. Sure. And um, Ziona, I wonder if you had a view on that. How do we make the flex office work? You mentioned the big buildings that we've been pushing for such a long time. Uh, how do we sort of transform those? Well, I think that it's important to identified that there's a spectrum of flex office models, you know, from the more serviced variety to the more standalone. And in work that we've done, we found that the uh, flex office occupiers who really don't want uh, much support, they want to come into something that's ready to plug in, get moving, but they don't want to be hassled by the operator. They know how to do their business. They know how to run their own spoke. It might be to get a dedicated team that's uh, responding to a particular pitch or bid or a new uh, product or service innovation going, but they don't need to be have their hands held. Whereas there are other aspects of the flex model that are much smaller, more, uh, more individual, don't have their own infrastructure organizationally uh, or in terms of IT support and who do want help. And so 
I think that there's a range of models and it's really important for success to understand how the space is going to be um, adopted and who's going to run it. And if you do have a more service oriented model, a critical aspect, in fact, is who's going to run it. And our research has shown that the success of uh, service oriented centers stands or falls by the, on the center manager's capability. So you back right into the hospitality model there, whereas the last thing that the bigger occupier of flex space wants is to be treated as if they're in a hotel. So there is a difference, and I think we need to, to be uh, more graduated about that. While I'm up, can I just pick up a point that Alison made that I think is so important? Um, the notion that the context in which we are will change with other variables like electric vehicles is critical. And we often tend to forget that we, op that we live and work in a multifactorial environment that's where all the levers and pulleys are changing at different rates. And some years ago, I did a series of studies at Chiswick Park. The first of which said, you know, this is, uh, there was a response that said, there's not enough car parking here. You know, how could they put up this office development with so little car parking? In fact, there was a very big allocation and was the max that the uh, planning authority would allow. We did a study two years later, which was after the congestion charge had become embedded in London and people's expectations of travel to work had changed. And not a single person referenced the car parking allocation. So things move fast. Uh, not only in terms of built environment technology, but in terms of the context. And Alison's point is profoundly important, and I just wanted to endorse it and say how proactively we should think about everything that's changing around us, not just the building and the fit out. Thank you, Ziona. Um, I've got a couple of other questions I wanted to ask. One of them is sort of linked to the flex office. Do we think we've seen the end of the single occupier building? So those sort of buildings in the early noughties, like Swiss Re at the Gherkin, is that is that done? Are we done with that? Or is it all going to be flexible office? I know, Sho, you've said it's going to go up and up. What do we think? Oliver, you're shaking your head. Uh, well, ben, I, I would just say on that, I mean, um, g and uh, you know, we occupy one office um, and, you know, we're, we're about to embark on a fit out that um, you know, we, we're intending to stay in that office, but we're just gonna kind of change it and make it um, more about well-being, make it more about the end user experience. We wanna make it more hospitable to have, you know, if clients wanna come in and sit down and have a coffee and chat about things. So we're still intending to keep our single occupier office. We just, you know, and, it, and it's just about looking at different things, improving end of trip facilities, bikes and showers and lockers and, and actually receptions, which QS is used to notoriously try and keep small to save money actually turning them into areas where we can all kind of sit and co-work and sit in pods and interact. And I think, let's face it, that's still really important. We can't all become hermits and, and reclusive and agoraphobic and sit at home. It's about balance, it's about moderation. So yeah, in my opinion, I think we'll, we'll, still, we'll still have that. Sure, any other thoughts on that one? Just, just to touch on that, I completely agree with Olivia, Oliver there, Ben. Uh, it's not a one size fits all. I think it's it's more about diversity and choice in the marketplace. And so definitely they'll continue to remain uh, a strong presence in the market. Great, thank you. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to ask. We're almost at time. Um, and it's just on thinking about other cities and whether any of you have got um, any understanding of how other cities are dealing with the getting people back to, to the office, whether um, there are any projects or any things that um, people are aware of in other cities. I think it's always good to, to look across uh, to America and to Europe and see what's happening there. Does anyone have any thoughts on, on that? It's okay if not. If any of our audience does, let us know. It's always good to, uh, to, to learn from what our peers are doing in other cities, so do let us know. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap up then. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers, uh, amazing presentations, and uh, Ziona and Alison for joining our panel. Um, this is unfortunately all we've got time for. You can download our uh, report, Work London Office Revolution, from our website, nla.london. Um, if you haven't already, then please do book your tickets for the London Real Estate Forum next week at the Barbican. Um, I'll be there. I've got a, a few sessions over there, so hopefully I will see you then. Um, we're now just going to throw up a short poll just to give you uh, the chance to give us some feedback on the session. And I hope to see you again, uh, either at one of these online or in person very soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye.